Gilmore City Council is now in session. Will the clerk please take the roll? Council Member Baker? Here. Please use your microphone. Here. Council Member Marshall? Present. Council Member Kugler? Present. Council Member Shrebnik? Here. Mayor Herbig? Here. Deputy Mayor O'Kane? Present. Council Member File? Present. All present. Would you all please stand and join me in the flag salute? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next on the agenda is the agenda approval. Unless the chair hears any objections, the agenda will stand approved. Seeing no objections. The agenda is approved. Next, we have a proclamation for Black History Month. Whereas Black History Month is intended to both recognize and pay tribute to the many contributions of Black and African American people to our shared history, society, and culture of the United States of America. And whereas through bravery, perseverance, commitment, hard work, faith, and resolve, often in the face of prejudice and hardship, Black and African American people have enhanced and advance every aspect of American life. And whereas for over two and a half centuries, Black and African American people have struggled against the cruelties of slavery and Jim Crow segregation, as well as discrimination in social, cultural, political, and economic systems, and having faced disproportionately economic hardships and social inequalities. And whereas despite extraordinary human trials, Black and African American people have fiercely, passionately, lovingly, and courageously shaped American society and values through service, leadership, intellectual power, and the promotion of strong moral character in every walk of life. And whereas this nation is strengthened and enriched by citizens of every race, religion, color, and creed, this February, we celebrate the cultural heritage, diverse contributions, and unbreakable spirit and patriotism of Black and African American people. And whereas Black History Month challenges us to learn from the many deeds and contributions of people of national and local renown, as well as Black and African American people in every walk of life who have enriched their country and communities in ways that make them American heroes. And whereas Black History Month summons every member of our Kenmore community to strive to build on our togetherness and cultural awareness, celebrate our diversity and intersectionality, and to create a future that does not compromise any American's right to equality or access in the quest for knowledge, economic prosperity, individual and collective achievement, spiritual development, and cultural richness. Now, therefore, I, Nigel Herbig, Mayor of the City of Kenmore, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby declare February 2023 Black History Month in the City of Kenmore. The city makes this proclamation to celebrate the Black and African American community as an affirmation of the city's commitment to protect and serve everyone who resides in it, in, works in, or visits Kenmore without discrimination, and of its beliefs in dignity, equality, and civil rights for all people. Next on the agenda is public comment. We welcome our community members to the council's meeting in this forum. The council does not engage or dialogue with the public. The primary role of the council is to listen. We'll hear from our on-site guests first, followed by our virtual guests. If you're online, please use the raise hand feature now if you wish to speak. All guests must address their comments to the mayor and city council. The clerk will acknowledge your request and call your name when it's your turn. Please, uh, your time will start when we confirm that we can hear you. Please state your name and city of residence for the record and keep your comments to the allotted time. We will not split your time with others or reset your time except by express approval of the presiding officer. Screen sharing is not allowed. You can submit materials to the council or clerk in advance. Please do not comment about pending development projects on which the council will make future decisions as those are quasi judicial matters and council members must limit their communications about such matters. This meeting is being recorded. Thank you for taking the time to express your comments. Clerk. Thank you, Mayor. We ha currently have 10 individuals signed up for on-site public comment, and we'll start with Lori Sperry, followed by John Peoples, then John Culver. Testing one, two, three. Am I even close? Can you hear me? Okay. I'm Lori Sperry, City of Kenmore, former City Council member. Thank you, Mayor and City Council members, for the opportunity to provide citizen comment. So my topic is the proposed ta new taxes for climate change and affordable housing programs. So I'm gonna start with a question. 
My question is, does it make sense to add new staff positions and new programs at this time, particularly when there is not enough revenue to pay for it without increasing taxes? I did the math that read the memo and the total amount of tax increase would be 1.5 million over the two, next two years. Utility taxes, gar taxes on garbage and increasing car tabs are some of the most regressive and a particular burden for working families, lower income, elderly, poor, adding financial stress to so many who are feeling, already feeling a lot of pressure. Um, years ago, when I was a council member, I went down to the NUD to pay my water bill. I probably was late and that's why I went down there. And I, the lady that, at the window was a little, I don't know, she just seemed to relieve that I was there just to pay my water bill. Well, it turns out that, um, and I voted for this, we had just passed a, a franchise fee. So everybody's water bill increased. And it wasn't a lot, I don't, I, I don't recall, but it wasn't you know, what I considered a lot. Turns out they had had a string of people coming down there, angry, in tears, wondering how they were gonna pay their water bill. And that lesson always stuck with me because things that seem like a little bit can really be a lot and add a, a lot of stress to people, especially during this current economic climate. Um, you're, I'm sure you're all aware of, you know, the inflation. There's, you know, an article I just read where they're saying that uh, families are spending an average of $371 more a month just because of inflation. Uh, what you may not be aware of is just this 1st of January, um, Washington State has um, started collecting the uh, tax, the carbon taxes on fuel. So Department of Ecology is thinking that will add another 46 cents a gallon to gasoline. And of course, we all know about the housing prices. So um, the housing prices, of course, led to higher assessments. And um, I think it was November, I got a call from a friend of mine. And she was really concerned because she had gotten a letter from her mortgage company that her mortgage payment was going up $200 a month. And she was worried about how she could afford it being a single mom. And so, you know, she was asking me, you know, what, what mine was and well, I pay the taxes directly. So I actually don't know what they're going to be, but I do know that my assessment went up along with everyone else's um, since gone down, but I still have to pay the taxes on that. Um, and I probably shouldn't, work out math like this, but in order for me to pay my taxes for property Thank taxes, you, Laura, your time is up. Okay, well, I guess I better work on my timing. <laughs> Thank you. John Peoples, Ken Moore, Happy New Year, everybody, City Council. This past week saw the first March for Life in Washington, D.C., since the blessed Dobbs Supreme Court decision overturning the tragic and diabolical Roe v. Wade decision. I invite the city council to give thanks to God for this opportunity for more preborn human beings to see the light of day and enjoy all that their unalienable God-given rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness can give them. Just across the street is CareNet of Kenmore that provides counseling and other services and support to both mothers and their pre-born children. It is disappointing that no one from the city has made any public statement lamenting the vandalism and intimidation this blessed organization has suffered since last year. I noticed that the proclamation for Black History Month fails to even mention the innocent victims of murder at the hands of abortionists. Dr. Alveda King reminded us at the March for Life that 362,762 black babies were murdered by abortionists in 2020, 30% of the total of abortions committed that year. The city council has previously lamented that blacks are disproportionately, quote, affected by this thing or that thing compared to their 13% or, or so of the US population yet not a whimper from you when it comes to their murder by abortion. So sad. We, are re we were reminded yesterday at the Lord's Supper that Jesus gave his life and body to be broken for our sins and for our salvation. Abortion works in the exact opposite manner. An innocent child broken and killed for the convenience of a few adults. I continue to hold out hope that your hearts will be warmed and moved to lament these victims too. And I truly am honestly very happy that none of you were aborted. Thank you.
John Culver, followed by Dakota Rash and Anurag Mishra. Good evening, Council. John Culver, Kenmore. Uh, want to talk about the cap. Uh, this has fluctuated a lot. We started with a big number saying well, we're going to need $1.5 million or so to completely fund it. We continue to use language of completely and fully funding cap without coming anywhere near that number, which is a problem. Um, the recent, well, the, the presentation that's coming up tonight, uh, the figure I see is $247,000. It happens alongside a lot of language that invokes crisis and the emergency and sort of the magnitude of this moment, which, you know, is somewhat unprecedented. Um, well, anyway, it's it's 1.6% of our budget. It's our top priority issue. What sense does it make to allocate less than 2% of your budget to something that you say is so direly important? Um, I feel a lot of I think dizziness might be the word. Why, why do we say things are important and not fund them? Um, if it's a step forward more things, okay, cool. Like that's a, that's a start, but we can do a lot better. Um, we shouldn't, you know, this ain't a win, <laughs> A. <laughs> but B, like, you know, want to drive home. Like we, you know, there are folks in the community who are ready to like reverse engineer and, and help with this if, if there are tasks that the community can be doing so we don't have to have $100,000 line items, we can do it. We can do this research. We can do research on grants. We can do all kinds of community engagement stuff. Um, we need to see more though. This ain't it. Um, dig deeper. That's all I got. Thank you. Good evening, Kenmore City Council. Thank you for opportunity, uh, the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Dakota Rash. I am a citizen of Lake Forest Park, but I have been spending my weekends walking around Kenmore and talking to people about the cap. These are 60 postcards to you all that I'm told will be distributed later. Um, rather guerrilla effort, didn't like check citizens lists or anything like that, but I just wanted to gauge people's interests and what they would feel about a commitment to address climate change and they feel very strongly about it. Nearly everyone I talked to was game to take climate action and they're hoping you will too. So I'll read one of these briefly. It says, Dear Kenmore City Council, thank you for making preventing and adapting to climate change your top priority. The next step is to fully fund the climate action plan. Hire a cap manager, administrative assistant, and ecologist. Appoint a community climate committee to work on engaging the residents of Kenmore. Allocate 1.1 million annually to accomplish these goals and fund critical climate projects until the climate specialists hired tell you what they need in greater detail. There is no time left. We need fully funded action now. Be the climate leaders you promised to be. So, Sometimes when I'm up here, I remember every single detail of what I'm going to tell you. And sometimes I just need to speak from the heart because it leaves my head. What does it mean to live up to a commitment? It doesn't feel like outsourcing your funding to federal and state sources. It doesn't feel like taking action two or three years down the road to something that you say is your top priority and is the existential crisis and greatest challenge of our era. What does it mean to live up to that commitment? It means to address the inertia that comes when one makes goals and then needs to fulfill them. It means taking bold action in an era where we need to figure out new solutions and be creative and collaborative. That's what it means to live up to a commitment. It doesn't mean to allocate a third of the funding that your city says it will take to address these actions. Please dig deep tonight and fully live up to your top commitment, both in terms of action and in terms of the budget for 2023 and 2024. Since I have some extra time on the clock and I love a good uh, rebuttal comment, I will add a little bit on um, the disproportionate impact of climate change. It hits those who can't afford to take a hit first. And so any funding that you put into addressing climate change helps those who are less economically well off because things like inflation are caused and will be caused by climate change and drought and all the things that come with it. We need to build ourselves up now while we have the flexibility to tinker with things like taxation funding before we are just scrambling to address a never ending crisis. Thank you.
Hello, City Council. My name is Anurag. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk. Here I want to talk about supporting the full funding for the CAP and as an environmental engineer who is actually uh, looking at all these reports and all these news items every day, this is the most critical thing that you can spend money on at this day. We are actually worried. We know all the students in high school and younger students, they are actually worried about the future. They really do not know how the climate environment will look like 10 years, 15 years from now onwards. So it is important when we have the time, I mean, we, we are running out of time already, whatever we can invest in any climate related projects, we should do that. So I would suggest uh, uh, request the city council to live up to its commitment and fully fund the CAP program. Thank you. Jeffrey Pooley, followed by Jeff Rash, William Crichton, and Elizabeth Mooney. Good evening, um, Jeffrey Pooley. I'm a Kenmore resident. Um, I wanted to echo the comments uh, to in support of the climate action plan and fully funding the climate action plan. Um, I used to think of climate change as a global issue, and it is. Uh, but what I have learned from my fellow citizens is it is so much also a local issue. Um, it, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that so much of the time we, we send out our responsibility to the state, to the federal, to the global communities when we have so much opportunity and responsibility locally. Um, the, the plan proposed uh, kind of starts from a baseline of hiring a cap manager. And I agree that that is an excellent first step. Um, but and, and I think that the expertise of that cap manager, we can leverage to understand what our opportunities and risks are in this community. It's hard to fund uh, the cap when we don't know specifically where that money is going to be going to. And so I view this as an excellent first step, but I would encourage you to continue to look for funding sources in preparation for that cap manager to arrive. I also think that I also want to support the continued uh, staffing of the city, specifically as it regards uh, the climate action plan. Um, I, I echo the comments that we need expertise, scientific expertise in the form of an ecologist. Um, and, and associated support staff. Um, that's how we're going to understand where those risks and uh, opportunities are. I also think that we have an opportunity to leverage the passion and expertise of our citizens. Um, we, we have had tremendous success with things like the Financial Sustainability Task Force, the DEIA uh, committee, uh, all these committees. You're getting volunteer free labor and lots of expertise from people who are passionate about these issues. I think that, that a, a citizen committee um, to supplement these staff members could be an excellent source of, of expertise. And that will also enable, uh, not we don't need to, to view uh, the climate action plan as just these dollars that we're putting towards the, the uh, these specific programs, but everything that the city is doing, all of the development that we're doing, how we design the roads, how we zone things are all going to impact uh, our climate action plan. And to the extent that we can get citizen feedback on these issues and have that expertise on these issues, we can synergize the, this program with all of the other programs to have a, a, an impact that is greater than the sum of their parts. I also want to make a comment on the finance. I understand the difficulties that the city faces um, from funding sources. I was on the Financial Sustainability Task Force, um, and I just want to say that I am absolutely delighted and happy to pay the taxes that are proposed and more. I know that the city is, is working hard to find ways to, to make those not regressive. Um, thank you. Your time is up. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff Rash, and I'm a citizen of Kenmore. Passion. That's what you need to get this thing going. Uh, most of my adult life, I've done work in the environmental field. I was supervisor of capture for the Exxon Valdez. Um, for the past 30 years, anytime a marine mammal would come up dead on the beach, I was there doing a necropsy. Most of the problems that happened to those animals were environmental and see it already happening in Lake Washington. You can see it happening in the backyards of our neighborhoods. You can see it happening in the streets. It's not something that's hidden. 
It's something that's evident every day to each and every one of us. And we have children, we have pets, we have adults, we have a whole mixture of thing in this committee, in this town that uses Lake Washington, that walks in the parks, that walks around the wetlands. You've got to start having thought for it now before it's too late. You don't want to have things like um, oil spills or anything like that going on in Kenmore. You have pops, persistent organic pollutants going on every day when people are building fires in their yard, when people are dumping oil and grease in the streets. So I encourage you to start thinking about this now before it's too late and you can't really do anything about it. Thank you. William Crichton, longtime resident of Kenmore. I was raised in, I was raised on Queen Anne Hill in Seattle, the greenest hills and the bluest skies. But I saw that city slide to a wasteland of zombies and homeless druggies and, and petty thieves, legalized larceny. And I guess I see these tax increases as a move in that direction. As you increase taxes to support lower income people and cap administrators and other sorts of bureaucracies, we're going to slide in that direction that we've seen Seattle go in. I'd like to see more money spent on police, police uh, officers and police support. <coughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Mooney. I live in Kenmore since 1995. I wanna just right off the bat say I support funding the Climate Action Plan and Dakota Rashes, his dad, Mr. Rashes comments, Jeff Pooley's, John Culver's. Okay, now I'm transitioning. I fully support David Morton's comments. They'll be coming in later and you've received his letter. So regarding asphalt emissions, first of all, thank you council for hiring Cascadia being an intervener in Cadman's appeal of the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency's air permit. Thank you for being an active force, all of you. The council did this with the citizens. Cadman should be testing about now. We all would like to know when Cadman's going to test, how soon we can get the results. We look forward to working with the city in its role in enforcing the permit. Regarding missing middle. Regarding the missing middle vote, you passed on November 7th, 2022. You have said you support transparency. Yay. We are appealing the missing middle updates to the comprehensive plan. We met with the city's attorneys on Friday, John Hendrickson and I, because the council said when they passed this, they want to re-engage the public in the public process. Therefore, please do accept our proposal. Acknowledge that we need a full environmental impact statement, not a simple determination of non-significance. That's shocking. Let's start over with the public. The reason that Jim Myers and I are involved in this appeal is that a decision this important should be thoroughly reviewed for its environmental impacts. What are the effects of full build out on water, on air, on streets, on our shorelines, our lake, our salmon, our trees, and on our people, the families living here, including the business, the economic impacts. Let's start over. If we want a public process about something this important, let's start over and include the public. We recognize that although this has already been a drawn out process, the final version was very different from that which was initially proposed. You clearly have the attention of many citizens now. We need to rebuild public confidence in this process, beginning with a transparent discussion of all the options and their environmental impacts. While 2022's year of the tiger was decorated as a positive and active energy, the year of the rabbit is supposed to embody a different energy, focusing on kindness, relaxation, contemplation, and quietness. So let's begin 2023 by working through the details in a thorough and thoughtful manner together while building trusting relationships, relationships in our community. Please accept our proposal. We need an environmental impact statement. 
John Hendrickson, followed by Ryan Johnson and Danielle Olson. Council members, John Hendrickson, Kenmore, Washington. Um, I'm asking the council tonight for transparency on whether or not you support House Bill 1110 on the missing middle that's right now in the House Committee on Housing and Local Government. Um, we need someone to make a motion to say that you don't support this or you do support this. Send it down to Olympia. Also send it to our three representatives that we had here on January 5th. Uh, when we had the legislative send off. Senator Stanford said he, he they're drinking the Kool-Aid hook, line and sinker on this. He thinks they should have multiple housing, multi, multiple family housing in the whole, all urban growth areas. Uh, Representative Kolba used the uh, racist and exclusionary zoning that Kenmore is a racist community historically, fundamentally. And, and uh, that's why we need to get rid of single family homes. And Representative Dewar, she parroted really what the city put out for the Planning Commission and the public, how the US made affordable housing illegal. So pretty sinister stuff for this uh, single family zone. So personally, I believe the missing middle policy lacks any serious responsible adult analysis or deliberation. I don't understand how you could support throwing a bill that throws out the promises of the Growth Management Act, that we would balance growth with quality of life. We didn't know what the answer was. We're going to work towards it. Now we're not working towards it in this bill. We don't have anything except the bureaucracy that's left over for staff to regulate us, how we live, not in a single family home. Multiple family homes, you can do your climate stuff and have all kinds of people coming over and checking your carbon footprint. So, um, you know, if you look at it, the approach I think is both childlike in approach, but it's buttressed with an overt meanness and hostility. So if you look at the Welcome Home, Washington advertising this going on TV for this bill, Washington, Homes for Washington is a growing coalition of advocates, policymakers, and neighbors across Washington state working for solutions for housing stability and abundant home choices in all our community. Join us. Together we can rein in rents and home prices, reverse decades of residential segregation, exclusionary downzoning, curb sprawl, and climate pollution. God, everything. You know, why do we have to have separate? Why can't we have single family zoning and multifamily? We have 45 acres out here. You can go 45 stories tall. And thanks to the honorable council members who can make housing affordable, people at the 30% level can only pay 10,000 a year for, for Thank your, you. your time mortgage is up. and your utilities. And you can make that happen because you guys are that special. Mayor and city council, Ryan Johnson, Kenmore. Uh, first, I'd like to agree with my fellow citizens, please fully fund the cap. But as you review your overall climate plan, there is one element not mentioned in the cap I'd like you to consider. As you know, renewables such as solar can help with power creation, but since those power sources are inherently inconsistent, any renewable energy policy also needs to include a discussion about clean energy storage. So it's energy storage I'd like to talk to you about, specifically green hydrogen. I'm going to quote from an Economist article in November. Environmentalists love that green hydrogen can be made with renewable energy. And the biggest force pushing hydrogen forward in 2023 will be a tidal wave of government money in America. It goes on to say that total investment in American hydrogen might reach $100 billion by 2030. I'd like to point out here that this technology can be used for things like heating homes, fueling cars, and also greenifying heavy industries that are typically hard to electrify. This energy will also be cost competitive due to subsidies in the Inflation Reduction Act that the article describes as staggering. I'm also aware that you may have heard of the promise of hydrogen before, but to quote the article again, uh, but governments and investors are betting that this time will be different. So a tidal wave of public and private investment is about to go into green hydrogen, but where will that money go? The answer is the Department of Energy is in the process of determining that right now. This is from a Washington Department of Commerce press release on January 5th. 
joint Washington, Oregon regional concept paper, one of 33 proposals to receive encouragement to proceed to, towards potential billion dollar federal funding award. To be clear, the DOE uh, will be selecting six to 10 green hydrogen hubs, each of which will receive a billion dollars. Uh, for that release, the project list, which is, uh, will be included in that massive grant proposal, has not yet been determined, and the final deadline is April 7th. So I would strongly encourage you to reach out to the Pacific Northwest Hydrogen Association, the public-private partnership overseeing that grant proposal, which is supported by the governor and partially funded by the legislature, uh, to see where Kenmore can fit into that green energy future. And while I'm usually in favor of a tax code with minimum exemptions, I do think there is a place for temporary tax reductions to encourage companies in growth industries, which also help the planet to locate here. I think green hydrogen fits that description. And so I would ask you to consider that as you review your climate policy, especially since it costs nothing to do so. By choosing to become a leader in green hydrogen technology, you can be part of a renewable energy hub that will not only provide good jobs and lower energy bills, but most importantly, ensure the health and safety of our community and our planet. Thanks. Uh, last thing, the asphalt plant. I know you hear about it every week. I'm not gonna jump on that pile, but I do think it could probably be helped with some better messaging. So I've heard a lot of really informative presentations here that could make a good future one. Thank you. Danielle. Good evening, City Council. I'm Danielle Olson, and I live here in Kenmore. Um, first of all, I do support Missing Middle Goldilocks housing, which is not too small, not too big, just right for certain families. But my main message is please fully fund the Climate Action Plan. The climate crisis impacting our lives now, smoke seasons, egg shortages, fisheries disappearing, uh, toxic algae, closed beaches, heat waves, all of these things are happening now. This is not an abstract or distant danger. So please fund the Climate Action Plan. Thank you. Mayor, I have no additional um, individuals signed up for on-site public comment. Can we move on to virtual? Yes. If you are virtual and would like to give public comment at this time, please use the raise hand function. Once you are promoted, please wait until it is your turn to unmute and turn on your camera. We currently have 11 individuals signed up for virtual public comment, and we will take them starting in this order. Beretta Gomillion, followed by Stacey Valenzuela, David Morton, and William Towie. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I am Veronica Chameleon, Executive Director of the Center for Human Services, and I live in Shoreline. I'm, I'm here today to make a comment on establishing a Housing and Human Services Manager for your city. CHS, my agency, has provided human services in numerous cities throughout the years, some with a Human Services Manager and some without. I can tell you without hesitation that the cities that have this position are by far the most effective and efficient cities to work with. A human services manager is a coordinator, a collaborator, and a facilitator, and is key to advancing the quality of life in this city. This position will be even more impactful as the city plans to bring in more affordable housing and additional human services. I strongly urge you to create and fill the housing and human services manager position and I offer my services to you if I could be of any assistance in the process. Thank you very much. Stacey, Stacey, Valenzuela. Go ahead. Stacey Valenzuela Kenmore. Thank you for the council and city support for PSCAA and residents for cleaner air in Kenmore. People love Kenmore because of the open spaces, natural habitat, trees, wildlife, despite the actions of some that may have failed at protecting our city. We need to clearly be able to see by all actions that staff planning commission work and funding show the council and resident priorities. The will of the people is being implemented and not dismissed by staff workload. Our wildlife trees, ecosystems, and wetlands need to be protected over recreational activities and development larger complexes or homes. Kenmore's top priority, the CAP plan, needs to be funded as it is a crisis now and include industry, 
the huge contributor of greenhouse gases and pollution. The legislation released grants for infrastructure, affordable housing and climate action. The city has already overpaid for the property for public works and this project should be held off until grants are received to build or fund that space that may be needed in 15 years for only a few employees, not putting additional financial burden on residents at this time that didn't even support these actions. The three surveys that were done in 2019 are still seem to be ignored. The number one was natural habitat and trails, the second, a community center, and the third, a community swimming pool. Nowhere on the survey did the residents support a boathouse, kayak club, playgrounds, a sports field, field barely made the list. Again, funds being used for a few. And let's talk about affordable housing, the number two priority is given a fraction of the amount as public works. And yet, where is the real crisis need? Our very low affordable housing under 50 AMI for our low income workers and the 30% AMI for fixed income and low work income workers. We also need enforcement of the TOD affordable housing ordinance. We need change. The challenge is for you to support our majority of our residents, their request funding the CAP plan. Now, the low 50% AMI and extremely low 30% below affordable housing and your top priorities first before a may needed public works or other enhanced services. We are also seeing an upswing again in COVID cases and many are suffering from inflation. We may need to make sure our lower income residents will not be affected and have an exemption from increases in different taxes. Kenmore can do a lot better. And I hope you find this adoption of the CAP plan and low affordable housing. Thank you. David Morton, go ahead. Good evening, council members. I'm David Morton. I live near Redmond. I'm deeply grateful to the city of Kenmore for taking a stand against CAD, CADMAN's appeal of PSCAA's order of approval number 11861 of CADMAN's notice of construction at their asphalt plant in Kenmore. Also, I applaud Kenmore's opposition to CADMAN's motion for a stay of certain conditions in the order, a stay which is denied by the Pollution Controlled he uh, Hearings Board. Residents of Kenmore care deeply about the health and well-being of their community. An asphalt plant can cause a host of negative health and environmental impacts, including increased air and noise pollution. The health risks associated with exposure to the pollutants emitted by an asphalt plant are documented and include respiratory and cardiovascular pro problems, as well as cancer. Kenmore is a beautiful city known for its natural beauty and recreational opportunities. Residents of Kenmore have a right to protect their city and their way of life from the negative impacts of industrial pollution. The city's opposition to Cadman's appeal and motion for stay is a strong statement that Kenmore will not tolerate industrial pollution at the expense of people's health and community. The city's opposition to Cadman's appeal and motion sends a message that Kenmore will not be a willing host for industrial pollution that harms their community. Kenmore will not be a sacrifice zone for the profit of others. Many residents of Kenmore are united in their opposition to the asphalt plant's air pollution. They have come together to make their voices heard and are grateful to the city for listening to their concerns and taking action to protect the health and well-being of their community. The city's efforts to oppose Cadman's appeal and motion for stay demonstrate that the city is truly committed to protecting the environment and public health. In conclusion, I thank PSCAA for their efforts to ensure that the asphalt plant meets environmental and health standards. I thank the city of Kenmore for opposing Cadman's motion for a stay of PSCAA's order of approval. The city's opposition makes a clear statement that Kenmore will not sacrifice public health for industrial pollution that harms the community. Kenmore 
is a strong and united community that will continue to fight for the health and well-being of its residents. The opportunity for public comment is greatly appreciated. Thank you. William Towie. Mayor Herberg, council members, good evening. My name is William Towie. I'm the executive director of Lake City Partners Ending Homelessness, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to you this evening regarding the proposed housing and human services manager. We deeply support this position. And as mentioned earlier by another provider in the human services field. This type of position is a sound investment, in my opinion, and the opinion of my peers, because it deeply increases the effectiveness of limited resources that serve the housing and human services landscape. Homelessness and housing are the number one and number two items on the top of a recent survey by the Puget Sound Regional Council and are a concern for all residents of Puget Sound and particularly in the King County area. At Lake City Partners Ending Homelessness, we operate the enhanced shelter at the Oaks in Shoreline. And it is the only shelter of its type in the North King County area. We see an increasingly challenging landscape regarding homelessness, housing insecurity, and the intersection of behavioral health and mental health. The need for integrated, collaborative, informed, and efficient services delivery has never been more important than it is today. Our work with other cities in this area clearly demonstrates the benefit of municipal governments getting ahead of this problem as best they can because there is no avoiding the consequences of housing shortages, difficulties in people paying their rents, and how human services relate to the impact we see in front of our eyes every day in our neighborhoods, our cities, and our families. Nearly everyone in our communities is infected, is affected, excuse me, by the impact of homelessness and housing. So I deeply encourage you to uh, pursue this housing and human services manager, uh, and would also note that it is an important element of risk mitigation for cities who are leaning into important interventions in this space. Thank you. Next, we have David D. Please provide your full name for the record, followed by Nancy Hansen, Tracy Bonashinsky, Cherry. Please provide your full name for the record. David, go ahead. Uh, Mayor and City Council members, this is David Dorian. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead. Great. Thank you. Uh, so many, many people have shared very good arguments for why we need to adopt both the Climate Action Plan funding and the Housing and Human Services funding. So I'll, I'll take a different tack and share an, another uh, line of, of why we should do it. So I'm just going to say $11.53. I'm going to say it a couple more times. $11.53. $11.53. Because I, I think sometimes when we have people that are just generally anti-tax, they will try and spin this up as, as if uh, it's, it's an impossibility. Now, that's not to discount what some people have shared around equity. It's very important that we take a, a non-regressive approach to taxation. But for most of the residents of Kenmore, $11.53 a month is something that we can afford in order to make sure, as the last speaker shared, risk mitigation around housing and human services and to invest in, in ensuring that we, we have Kenmore in 30, 40, 50 years time with, with the Climate Action Plan. So I think looking through, and I, I've been scanning as quickly as I can uh, the, the documentation, it, this seems like a well thought out 
plan. I mean, that you, you heard from uh, some supporters of the climate action plan, they would like to see more. Um, I, I don't disagree with that, but I do think it's well thought out that part of the planning is for the, the climate action plan manager to seek out uh, state and federal grants that would backfill some of the, the gaps that we're seeing. So it's, it's not all coming from a, a taxation exercise. We are looking for the state and federal grants in, in some of the way that this is being funded. I think it's also important to note that the taxes that are shared, uh, many other local municipalities have these taxes already where we don't have them or have them at a higher level than, than we have them. Uh, so I, I just think the, the arguments that are clearly just broadly anti-tax are, are ones that really don't hold water here. Uh, I'd also like to address the, uh, the point made about uh, funding for police services. So looking at our 2021-2022 biennium budget, uh, in the final analysis, it looks like we spent 8.129 million on public safety, which is not just police services, it also in includes uh, court services, obviously. The proposed budget for 2023 to 2024 is 9.666 million for, for public safety. Quick scan, I'm happy to be fact-checked on this, but it looks like the highest increase as a budget item as well. So I, I don't think the city is not uh, focused on funding public safety. I think we're looking to do other things that need to secure the health and wellness of our residents. Thanks very much for your time. Nancy Hansen, go ahead. Um, hi, um, I am Nancy from Kenmore and um, I'm completely in favor of uh, fully funding the climate action plan, plus it could be more money for sure. And I have three items that are maybe maybe jumping ahead of the ball, but um, they re relate to the climate action plan and staffing. Um, I believe the staffing issue needs some more work. Uh, a variety of jobs and tasks is needed beyond only a director. I believe the council uh, needs to guide the direction of job descriptions associated with the climate plan. A notice from the city with a job description for the director position stated that it would involve working from an office. It is correct that much of this job is done from a desk, such as ensuring compliance with state and local laws and regulations and consulting and guiding staff work. But until there is staff to do on the ground work, um, that wouldn't be possible. I believe this needs more clarity from the council and more direction on job descriptions that will ensure the climate plan is followed as the council has designed it. Um, next, I'm expecting and hoping um, that at least one of the persons hired will be a biologist with background in water, streams, wetland and, and ground water systems. This should be a number one priority for Kenmore with its massive system of water sources that join with the Sammamish River and Lake Washington. Mapping of the underground water and wetlands needs to be a high priority before any new development decisions are made. Finally, I believe the concept of sustainability needs to be connected with the underlying goals of Kenmore's climate action planning. Uh, think of in terms of sustainability, um, thinking in terms of sustainability puts all we're doing into a more global context, not just a Kenmore issue, but seeing Kenmore as a small part of a larger picture. Um, and I let's see, I um, had a lot of reactions to the comments tonight, and I would love to have a chance to discuss more of the issues of the hu health and human services um, director position sounds wonderful. And also, I'd like to thank the council for all the um, tons of work that's been done recently and so much under pressure and so so rapidly in time um, and big changes. I really we really appreciate all of the work. Thank you. Tracy Bonashinsky. Yeah. Uh, Tracy Bonashinsky, Kenmore. I love the first part of the CAP and Health and Human Services presentation that is to come before you later tonight because it tells the truth right out of the gate. On slide two, you will be reminded that the top two city council goals for 2023 and 2024 are number one, climate action plan, and number two, affordable housing. Then the truth. Both are urgent crises that demand immediate action. Both need new funding above and beyond current resources. Then you will be treated to several slides of quotes. I liked those because I'm a sucker for a good quote. And then even more truth. The time is now 
to act and give both of these causes the resources they deserve. This is all so good. And then this part is really, really good here. Wrong starting point, fear and guilt. A better starting point, hope, empowerment, action, and love. This is a great presentation that would be made even better if it were followed by a more robust, stable, and certain funding proposal, more like the combination of full cap plus health and human services that staff presented to you in October last year. The full cap option provided city funds and all program elements to ensure that work is progressing regardless of the ability to obtain grants. The price of full cap was listed at $1.5 million. Is it a wild idea to ensure that we have the funds to make progress on our climate goals regardless of the ability to obtain grants? Given the severity of the crisis, I don't think so. Am I against grants? No. I'm not opposed to the city pursuing grants to fund climate action plan elements. I think we absolutely should. But we need to be able to do the work regardless of the outcome of any given grant round. Any grant money secured can be used to do even more. Other cities are grappling with the same climate and funding issues we are in Kenmore. For example, A20 passed in 2020 is the city of Ann Arbor's plan for achieving a just transition to community-wide carbon neutrality by 2030. And, and as, as an aside, uh, this is 20 years earlier than Kenmore's target, which I really think we ought to reconsider. They're funding this work in part through a 20-year tax assessment passed in 2022 with 71% support of Ann Arbor voters. Why did they go to the voters as a funding strategy? This is a quote from the city of Ann Arbor website. In Michigan, there are very few ways that local governments can raise revenue, and one of the few viable pathways is through millages. Right now, funding does not exist at the scale needed to address local climate change related needs and create local climate programs. The city continues to pursue, pursue federal grant state support philanthropic dollars and donations to advance climate work, but a millage provides a guaranteed and regular source of funding. Ann Arbor will have at least $6.8 million per year in funding from year one to meet their climate action goals. We could do this too. In order to meet this moment with all the hope, empowerment, action, and love it needs, we need to invest more money than the current proposal suggests. We can do this. I believe in us. Thank you very much for your service. Cherry, go ahead. Please provide your full name for the record. Good afternoon. My name is Cher Estete Rodriguez, um, and I would like to say I fully, fully support the CAP funding plan. Um, I've lived in Canmore for about five years now, and I absolutely love this city, and I love everything that you guys have to offer. Um, Lake Washington is something that was, has been very close to me since I was a child, and it pains me when I see trash, dead animals, and other things, you know, kind of being thrown about and strewn everywhere, um, and then seeing other animals eat those things, which can make them very sick, and um, yeah, it just kind of breaks my heart, so... I would love to actually see this take off. I know other cities have done it. I have traveled to mm -hmm. different places um, throughout the world where I've seen their beautiful climate um, plans and it's it works and it makes the city so much more inviting and wonderful to be a part of. Um, and even uh, Cascadia College where I attend has already started making strides to helping their students become a little more um, conservative with water and keeping the place clean and making everything look kind of beautiful. And I know a lot of my peers also agree with this um, CAP funding plan, because um, as a college student, I would love to grow up, have children, and not have them worry about, you know, the, the struggles about the future, especially when it comes to climate change. And that's a lot of things that you know, students are stressed and worried about in this moment. We don't know where to go with go towards in our lives when we don't fully have a grasp of what the future holds. So thank you very much and have a wonderful night. Thank you. Sherry, can we get your city of residence for the record, please? Oh yeah, sorry, I live in Canmore. Thank you. Thank you. We have Sarah Fletcher followed by James Olson, Chris Olson and Juliana Pooley. My name is Sarah Fletcher and I'm a resident of Lake Forest Park. Good evening, Kenmore City Mayor, Council and staff. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I am here tonight to support the citizens calling for full and immediate funding of Kenmore's Climate Action Plan. Climate change is a threat that is here now, so we need to take action now. 
Kenmore has made a commitment to climate action that it's our number one priority. I would urge you all to ask yourselves, does it honestly feel like a commitment to stake your climate action on getting grants? To me, that feels like good climate intentions, but outsourced commitment. When I reviewed the city's plan to fund the cap, two additional things stuck out to me. First was that the city is planning to only hire one person to both manage the entire plan and also find grants. I think even just the first part of that is overwhelming. We need rapid and bold climate action. Assigning one person to manage a citywide long-term plan that touches on such diverse subjects as pollution reduction, energy management, lobbying, ecological preservation, and municipal operations might let the cap survive, but it will do so in a greatly reduced form. If you hire a team of two, then at least they each have a sounding board they can collaborate with and bounce ideas off of one another. If you hire a team of three, then you get into real working capacity, introducing the ability to specialize and also cover for one another. What happens if the cap manager is the only person you hire and they get sick? Climate action and can more stops? Second, I am worried about the over-reliance on PSE. PSE is a gas company, plain and simple. If you look at what they're asking to build and expand, it all still goes right back to fossil fuels. What makes it worse is they don't even use those fuels here. They ship the gas off elsewhere to reap profit. An examination of their energy sources from 2020 to 2021 shows an increase in coal, the dirtiest fossil fuel. Kenmore should be looking at how it can incentivize its own clean energy generation, not cling to a gas company selling green daydreams. Please be the climate champions you promise to be and live up to your commitments. Thank you. James Olson, go ahead. Thank you. I'm James Olson, a citizen of Kenmore. I have three things I want to cover. One, uh, I want to thank Kenmore for addressing the uh, cement the cement plant. Two, uh, or asphalt plant, I should say. Two, I'm requesting uh, we move forward with the missing middle, uh, providing only single family homes and mass apartments and or condos is both short-sighted and rigid. Um, and as a result, um, it leaves the city with significant risks down the road. We only follow two, two solutions, two routes. Three, I wanna support the cap plan. Um, the costs aren't that great uh, if you really look at it, but the risks inherent in doing nothing are actually quite high. This is because the risks from climate change are very likely. In fact, you're seeing it now, so you're actually seeing that happen. Um, and the impact of those risks uh, can be very impactful. Um, as a senior project manager, I can tell you right now that if you don't manage your risks up front, those risks are gonna manage you. Um, and you're gonna end up spending a lot more money and a lot more problems down the road if you don't take it on now. Um, that's it for me. Oh, I do wanna add one thing. I did not know about PSE, or at least I just started to suspect for PSE. So I'm glad to hear that. Um, and it's deeply concerning that that's the power uh, source that we are sort of forced to use. Um, I came originally from Bothell, uh, coming here to Kenmore with the fact that we're so close to the trail and safely able to get to the trail. Although I would like to improve our uh, access. I know that 522 is with WashDOT, but we should work with WashDOT to uh, improve that um, so that we have other ways of getting transportation that will be less fuel impactful. Um, but the benefit I had gotten from where I was before was I wasn't in PSE. I was in with Snohomish um, PUD um, and they don't get their power in the same way as PSC. So I don't know what we can do about that, but that is a deep concern of mine. Thank you. Chris Olson, go ahead. Hello, um, I'm Chris Olson. I'm uh, president of the city of Kenmore. Um, and I've, I've here, obviously, I think, um, to speak for my support in a number of things. I'll just list them out real fast at the start. The Climate Action Plan, um, missing middle housing, and making sure that the city has the staff and ability to actually implement those things. Um, I've heard some people 
have concerns about having a new public works department. Um, I think it's hard for the city to do public works if they don't have a place to actually operate from, um, or at least one that can adequately meet their needs. So making sure that the city actually has the resources and sets itself up and gets itself into a position to address um, future plans and implement policy, I think is important. Um, as far as risks go, I, I kind of wanted to talk about the tragedy of the commons. There's this idea that we don't have to be the ones involved because if somebody else doesn't address climate change, then it negates what we do or, or at least undercuts what we do, right? Now we're spending money that they're not spending to get ahead, uh, economically speaking. And as such, nobody addresses climate change. They all point the finger and then nothing happens. Um, this is a pretty classic tragedy of the commons scenario. Um, and as such, the way that you break that mold, unfortunately, is just doing the right thing and putting money where it needs to go in this instance, um, or, or in other instances, regulating pollution generation. Um, I would also like to speak in support of citizen committee and removing barriers that limit effective action on climate change. For instance, having physical barriers for things like bike lanes, um, having more street trees, right? These are real methods of implementing action to address climate change. And they might not seem like it because they're related to other city works projects, but I think it's important that we kind of break apart that um, dynamic and realize that these things are interconnected with other city works policies and other city works. Um, that are being done. So another example would be community gardens or uh, wetland management or making parks that are integrated with wetlands, right? We can do these things in a manner that provides multiple benefits. Um, lastly, I would really like to see the city get a street sweeper for bike lanes or at least pay a contractor to clean bike lanes. I know I've said this before, but having vertical barriers and other separations between bike lanes and cars makes them feel safer and makes them safer for people using them which encourages people to actually use them. Um, I've seen parents with children trying to cross 522 on a five lane road next to an eight lane road, just trying to get to the Burke Gilman. And it'd be really nice to make sure they've got a safe place to do so. Thank you. Juliana Pooley. Juliana, you're muted still. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Um, I would like to, like many of my other Kenmore residents I'm from Kenmore, I would like to fully support funding the CAP. I appreciate that it is two pronged for both the climate crisis and the housing crisis. Both of these issues have kept me up at night, and I'm delighted to see a plan that addresses them both. So, um, so straightforwardly, I. Um, so many neighbors have already stolen my thoughts and said so many great things, but I think I just want to share my love for Kenmore. I love, um, I love growing up here. I've spent more than 25 years of my life here. I really love raising my children here. And the two things that I especially love is one, it is beautiful. We love the Burt Gilman. We love the views of Lake Washington. We love the parts of the parks and the sections that have become so walkable. And we also love the diversity. I have a kindergartner at Kenmore Elementary, which I'm assuming you all know is a Title I elementary school, which means that there is significant diversity in the <laughs> income of the students there. And this means that there's also significant diversity in the languages and race and backgrounds and housing situations of the students there. And it is honestly something that I love that my child from a young age gets to make friends and play and interact with these families that have so many rich experiences and you know, heritage that we do not have in our own home. And when I think about these two things that I love about Kimmore, how beautiful it is and how much diversity it is, of course, I'm going to just be all cheers for the cap. Um, specifically, I am supportive of the Housing and Human Services Manager. My graduate work is in homelessness and housing services. And I've worked in that field for a few years in the Bay Area and can tell you that we cannot understate how important that role is for a city. Um, and I was struck by an earlier comment 
that was framing some of the low income or homeless or addicted residents of the city of Seattle in a negative light. And I was really struck by the tone that these were other people, um, that these were other people that had somehow appeared within city limits. And I guess I just wanna reiterate that the programs that we are funding and the housing that is being considered, these are for our own, these are for the people in our community and addiction or loss of income or a variety of issues can hit us all. And they are existing in Kenmore, they are already here and I fully support all programs and support services, starting with housing and human services manager to help make our own local safety net stronger. And so we can take care of our own and we can help um, our most vulnerable neighbors. So thank you so much. Mayor, Mayor, I have no additional hands raised at this time. All right, next on the agenda is the consent agenda. The chair will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The consent agenda stands approved. Next, we have the business agenda. First item, 2023 annual docket for the Planning Commission presented by Community Development Director Debbie Bent and Principal Planner Lori Anderson. Good evening, Mayor Herbig and members of the City Council. So tonight we're here for our annual uh, review of the 2023 Planning Commission docket. This is a task uh, that you face every year. And what you are essentially doing is setting the work program for the Planning Commission for the upcoming year. This year, as you might expect, uh, the Items that we are recommending for the Planning Commission are a continuation of our 2024 state mandated comprehensive plan update. Two of the elements, uh, transportation and public services are already in process in front of the Planning Commission. Uh, we are recommending three additional elements, uh, the utilities element, the economic development element, and the climate change element to come before the Planning Commission this year for adoption uh, in the fall. Once the work on those elements is completed in front of the Planning Commission, they would turn their attention to the remaining three pieces, the downtown sub-element, the community design sub-element, and the surface water element. Those would then continue into 2024 uh, with an adoption then, and then that would be completion of this major update project. So, with that, I'll leave it open for your questions. Questions? I, Councilor Shrebnik? So I'm, I'm hearing the, the piece about, and, and maybe that's for a different discussion, the, the comp plan um, chapters or elements. Um, that is not the totality of what's in the prioritization chart and what the planning commission is going to be addressing. So I don't know, is that a different discussion or is that part of tonight's discussion? I'm not sure I'm following your question. So we're proposing five elements, some to be continued, some would be new in front of the planning commission this year for a fall adoption. And then once those are completed, the planning commission would turn their attention to re the remaining three pieces. Right. I guess I'm, I'm not being very clear. Sorry. Um, I, um, the, the piece about um, missing middle housing, I guess I'm, I'm aware that we're, and maybe that is no longer with the planning commission. Maybe that's with us. So I'm, I'm just trying to figure out kind of where that fits in. Right. So the missing middle housing discussion is ongoing and we'll be having an update to the council at the end of February but that is not something that is in front of the planning commission. Can I add something, Your Honor? Of course. Yeah, so this docket, I, I put it in two buckets. One is the, the work the planning commission is gonna be doing. And the other bucket is the work that you are gonna be handling 
directly as the city council. And that docket has both lists in there. So the planning commission work and then all other development regulations that we'll be bringing directly to you this year. Any other questions? Councilmember Shrebnik. All right, there, and, and again, maybe I'm a little confused on this, but the small houses on small lots is listed as a 2023. Right, plus. so. Um, yeah. Right, so actually, the the technical docket that you approve is for the planning commission's work but always with this packet we bring forward the items items that we think as as uh, rob mentioned would be coming forward directly to the council so small houses on small lots and in fact if you uh, turn to the prioritization chart there are a number of things yeah. uh, that would go directly to city council in community development that's where continuing work on missing middle occurs. Consider small houses on small lots if time allows and consider miscellaneous amendments to support more housing. Those items would come directly to the city council because they would be consistent with the already adopted uh, comprehensive plan land use and housing elements. Any other questions? I'll seeing none, the chair would entertain a motion to approve the 2023 annual docket for the planning commission. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, would the clerk please take the roll? On the motion to approve the 2023 annual docket for the planning commission, seconded by Deputy Mayor O'Kane, Council Member Kugler. Yes. Deputy Mayor O'Kane? Yes. Council Member Marshall? Yes. Council Member File? Yes. Council Member Shrebnik? Yes. Mayor Herbig? Yes. And Council Member Baker is absent at the moment. With six yeses and zero noes, the motion passes. All right. Uh, next item on the agenda funding ordinances and proposed budget plan for the climate action plan implementation and housing and human services presented by city manager Rob Carlinzi, deputy city manager Stephanie Lukash and environmental services manager Richard Sawyer. All right, City Council, it's good to be here tonight. And we're bringing to you uh, two very important topics and you've been deliberating, de deliberating on them for quite some time now. And um, we've incorporated your feedback and um, we're also hearing from the community as much as we can. I, I just wanna point out that I'm just really pleased with the public participation we've seen tonight on both sides of the issue. Um, I'm just really proud of my fellow residents tonight and how thoughtful they've been on, on these topics. So it's just really encouraging and, and uh, kind of energizes me for this presentation. Um, so Richard Sawyer is joining us remotely. He's got the sniffles, and didn't wanna get us all sick or anything. Richard, are you there? I am here, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for thanks for being available tonight. I know you're not feeling 100 percent. So thank you so much. No problem. Yeah. All right. So let's dig into this. Uh, we do have a slide deck to go through tonight, but please know that this slide deck is kind of the tip of the iceberg for information. There's a pretty lengthy memo in your packet. Um, it's about 10 pages long but it's made even longer than that with all the appendices in there. But uh, there's lots of detail on, additional detail on uh, this proposal found in the memo and in the appendices. All right, so as we all know, we all are keenly aware that the 
City Council's top two goals are climate action plan and affordable housing. And as we know, there are urgent crises that demand immediate attention now. And as we've said, and we've all, dis we've all discussed, they need new funding above and beyond current resources. Yeah, and so uh, can, you can hear me clear, Rob? Yeah. Great. So on this next slide, I, I hate just reading from a slide, but I've got a couple quotes here that I really think warrant saying out loud, just to remind council and, and the audience, um, kind of this urgency that we're facing. And, and so United Nations, um, and this quote, state that climate change is the defining issue of our time, and we are defining moments. From shifting weather patterns that threaten food production to rising sea levels that increase the risk of catastrophic flooding, the impacts of climate change are global in scope and unprecedented in scale. And without drastic action today, adapting to these impacts in the future will be more difficult and costly. And then to continue, um, this was a, a great quote also um, that touches on biodiversity loss and states that biodiversity loss, which is the loss of species, is happening right now around the world in unprecedented, in, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, I'm very congested, <laughs> is unprecedented in human history and in the last 10 million years. Today's global rate of species extinction is at least 10 to hundreds of times higher than the average over the past 10 million years. <clears throat> and if I could just jump in here, we, we don't hear about biodiversity loss as much as climate change. But what, from what I'm hearing and reading from, it's just as a big of an issue. They're connected, but um, it's, it's also just as concerning as climate change is. So they, I was listening to a podcast just recently about how the scientists are saying that it's kind of like a, a Jenga tower. I don't know if you've played Jenga before, but you know, if you, you don't wanna be the one that pulls out the piece that makes the whole thing crumble. And, and we depend on other species uh, for our survival, including the little creatures. And uh, when, when will that Jenga piece be pulled out of the puzzle? We don't know, but it's, it's getting scarier and scarier. Yeah, thanks, Rob. And this last quote, which touches on social impacts. So this is um, one of the key elements we focus on in our climate action plan. And I think this quote really touches on it uh, perfectly, but climate change poses the greatest threat to those least responsible for it, including low income and disadvantaged populations, women, racial minorities, marginalized ethnic groups, and the elderly. And so this is another uh, lens through the climate action plan that we we uh, really want to focus on um, with this um, proposal that we have. And we're also talking about the crisis in uh, housing and Human services, and we found some really relevant quotes that we felt told the story. One of them is from Nelson Mandela, and he says, Overcoming poverty is not a gesture of charity, it is an act of justice. It is the protection of a fundamental human right, the right to dignity and a decent life. And then FDR said, The test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much, it is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. And that's exactly what we're talking about with housing and human services and those in our community who have too little. And then the last quote here you'll see is from our governor who has been talking a lot about affordable housing, including the referendum that he's proposing in the future. But he said in November, over the long term, we need more housing that average workers can afford. And we know that in our community, it's also a huge challenge. And those solutions require every community to do their part, no matter how small or how large a jurisdiction, I think we all have an obligation. And that's what we're talking about tonight is we're here to recommend a way to do our part in housing and human services to help those who need it in our community. So we'll go to the next slide. There we go. And we're, we're calling them the twin crises because they are both, they're both crises and they do connect to each other and we're bringing them to you together intentionally. And we're saying, you know, we're not immune 
to either of these crises, and these are face, facing our whole, our, our, our community, our larger region, our nation, our world, and we need to move forward with these, both of these together so that we can best meet the needs of our community. And we've already adopted, you, can, you adopted council, the climate action plan last year, and it's ready to be implemented and just needs the funding. And that we have a regional and local role to play. We have many people in our community and we hear from them all the time who are struggling and we see them around in our community. And we feel like it's our job to help find people find and stay housed and access resources. And we think having a position here on staff who is an expert and who can be a connector is really important. And I think to Rob's point, we heard from several people tonight who spoke eloquently to this. And there's no denying we're in this business now. I don't think that maybe 10 or 20 years ago we were, but we definitely are in this business now as a city. It's an ever-growing body of work, and there are many areas that we're asked to sit at tables and be in conversations and contribute financially and in other ways. So the time is now to act and to give both of these causes the resources that they deserve. So don't go to the next slide yet. Sorry, Brian. <laughs> So pretty heavy stuff so far, right? It's like, it's a serious business and kind of concerning. Um, you can put, the, put it back up there on the screen. Um, but, you know, if we're coming from a place of fear or guilt, that's not good either. Uh, if, if you're coming from a place of fear, then irrational, irrational behavior tends to follow. So Brian, if you could go to the next screen. So instead of coming from fear or guilt, we really be, need to be approaching this from hope, empowerment, action, and love. And we're good at that here at the city of Kenmore. There's, you can point to a lot of things that you all have accomplished and our residents have accomplished from that place of hope, empowerment, action, and love. So that's how we wanna approach this. We don't wanna scare people into this. There are some scary things that we put on the screen, but that's not how we want to approach it. We want, we want us all to feel like there's hope and that we can do our part to help solve this situation, these, both of these situations. Next slide. Thanks, Rob. <coughs> Paul, sorry, Stephanie, I don't know if I started coughing over you before I was able to mute. <laughs> If I did, I apologize. Um, so with this climate action plan approach, <clears throat> what we want to highlight here is that we're we're following a well thought out process that um, we worked both internally with our partners such as K4C and the tools that they worked um, to put together uh, a plan that dedicates staff to manage implementation. This is critical in, in the success of, of implementing our plan. Um, we wanna make sure that we're aligning efforts with our regional partners. Um, and then uh, we wanna be sure that we're stepping up in stages that have clear and measurable goals. And what we wanna make sure we emphasize here is that these steps um, are still with the full intent of achieving our greenhouse gas reduction goal of 50% by 2030 and beyond. With the Climate Action Plan Manager, uh, some of the immediate steps that we can start doing would be to implement key components of the CAP now, try to start ex accessing existing resources, uh, such as grants, partnerships, that we can leverage to implement the city's Climate Action Plan, um, we can start applying for grants and establishing new partnerships or expanding existing partnerships. And then based on the above, the Climate Action Plan Manager can start getting a better sense and determine what staffing and resource gaps remain. And by fall, we want to come back to council with a proposal for additional staffing and resources and funding that would be supported by um, the work that we do this year. And similarly with the Housing and Human Services Manager, we're looking to hire that position now. And as you'll see there, there's a growing body of work that is already happening. And uh, these are eight bullet points are just some of the highlights. 
this new regional crisis response agency, RACER, 24-7 crisis clinic, community court. We have our first steering committee meeting tomorrow. This work is kicking off and will be an exciting new element to our judicial branch. Um, regional Coalition for Housing and North King County Coalition on Homelessness and many other organizations that we partner with on a regular basis and we meet with as well as the affordable housing projects that we have happening here in Kemore at the Shell property and the Holt property and others in the future. So there's already a lot of work already happening. Happening, This person would immediately be assigned and work on those things we're already doing. And then um, I'll talk a little bit more about the uh, researching whether to have a rebate program uh, in, a, in a future slide. So I'll come back to that one. We're looking at this, we know that grants are gonna be a big part of the future work in housing and human services. So this person, similar to the CAP manager would also research and apply for grants. There's so many opportunities and it's just, it's kind of like a fire hose for me sometimes. There's so many things and there's just not bandwidth and time in the day to research them all. So having someone who could develop an expertise will be really important. And then connecting residents to services and resources and having someone on staff who has expertise and knowledge about all the various nonprofit organizations doing this work is really important. Our front desk staff are constantly telling me stories of people who come in and need help and need something and they don't have the information or the knowledge and that's not their job to have that. So we're, we're trying as best we can, but to have a person who could have office hours that could meet with folks and help them would be really huge, I think, and a big service to our community. And then we're talking about, of course, a needs assessment. So a housing and human services needs assessment to better understand what the landscape in our community. And then based on that, determine staffing and resource gaps. And then similar to the CAP manager, come back by this fall with a proposal for how to proceed. This next slide shows a summary of the proposed expenses, um, chief among which are the new positions. We're proposing three new positions, the housing and human services manager, the climate action plan manager, and a new position in finance. We're calling it an administrative services manager. That's to help support these new lines of work that we'll be bringing on, plus the growing body of work we've been seeing in the finance department as we've taken on new programs. Of course, other um, pretty predictable uh, expenses such as the training and dues and things that go with these mm -hmm. positions. Uh, we may need to pay into some strategic partnerships. One example might be the uh, Eastside Climate Challenge, for example, um, education and outreach materials to the public, and then we're proposing some consulting services. Uh, a federal lobbyist, we used to have one, but we cut that right when the um, pandemic was happening in 2020. But uh, we really think that that federal lobbyist could help us a lot. Um, they uh, know how to navigate the myriad of grants that are back in Washington, D.C., they also have the contacts, not only with our congressional delegations, but also the uh, state of the federal agencies back there. Um, and they can just provide a lot of advice to us on how to apply for grants, how to go for um, community project funding, which is that more uh, politically um, focused funding source rather than a competitive grant. So we're strongly recommending that, and that, that lobbyist can help us both on the climate side and the housing and human services side. Um, and then uh, we may need some consulting services for grant application assistance, uh, continuing the work that Cascadia Consulting has done on the climate action plan, including recalibrating our greenhouse gas emissions periodically. And then also we're proposing a human services needs assessment and we would need some consulting services for that. Also, we have some funding in there for grant matches and then administrative support, which takes us to the next slide. I have a slide on administrative support costs, going that new position in finance, um, but also uh, other administrative support costs, including uh, the, these positions impacts on information technology, legal, human resources, insurance. Yes, our insurance goes up with body count, um, fleet facilities, et cetera. And then the next slide shows a high level summary of the, the 
both the proposed expenditures and the proposed funding sources. And you can see those numbers outlined uh, per category, climate action plan, housing and human services management, housing and human services and administrative support costs. <clears throat> and then we are proposing um, three funding sources and you can see the revenue generated from that. We, um, we've obtained these uh, funding sources both from our own projections and also from uh, Republic Services on the Solid Waste Utility Tax. The next slide highlights these three, these three funding sources. So right now we're proposing to, to fund all this, we're proposing a solid waste utility tax of 10%, uh, <clears throat> increasing the natural gas utility tax from four to 6%, and then increasing the annual vehicle license fee from $20 to $40 per year. And what that would do is it would reduce the general funds subsidy to the street fund and thereby free up that general fund uh, resource to help us with this package. We had Garrett Oppenheim do a comparison of uh, what the rates are for these three funding sources in neighboring cities. And this chart shows, you can see that um, all but Woodenville are at 6%, which is uh, the max cities can go to per state law without a vote of the people. Um, you can see that most of the cities, most of our neighboring cities have a garbage utility tax of some sort. This proposal would put us at the top with Mount Lake Terrace and Kirkland. And then you can see it's a mix of cities on whether they have a vehicle license fee and what the rate is. I just learned today that Shorelines has, has gone up to $50. Was it Shoreline or Lake Shoreline. Shoreline? Okay. Yeah, Shoreline just recently went up to $50. So you can see how we compare with other cities on these three funding sources. And then a question is, what would the impact be to a typical household? Um, for lack of better information, I picked my own house. Um, I have a 2,200 square foot house here in Kenmore. And I looked at um, what I would be paying um, in these additional uh, revenue sources. So solid waste utility tax, I have the three garbage cans, I, you know, the garbage can and then yard waste and recycling. And my garbage cans a pretty normal looking size. Um, and then natural gas, um, I might actually be on the higher end of the spectrum because I've got um, a gas fireplace, a gas furnace, a gas stove, and a gas water heater. And so I looked at what that would do and I conservatively estimated that it would be uh, about $36 a year that I would have to pay for my home. But if you, you have, if you have less gas utilities than that, then you'd be paying less. And what I actually did is in, in the memo, you'll see, uh, I took a snapshot of my gas utility bill and you'll see the therms I used for that for a particular month. And then I used, and then, so anybody can use that table and go in and calculate their, the impact to their own home. Then we averaged it uh, by month and $11.53 would be the cost to a typical household like mine. All right, um, Stephanie, I think you have the next slide. I do. And I thought it was really eloquent earlier in public comment that there were, there's at least one person I remember who talked about, you know, $11 may not seem like a lot, but it is to some people. And we know that and we agree. And so that's part of what we have on this slide is part of what we imagine the housing and human services manager's job would be to do. One of their first tasks, if this is approved and we move forward, is to do some research and look at, first of all, what re fee rebate and discount programs already exist and make sure we're maximizing those. And we'd actually heard recently that our residents are not maximizing all of the who are eligible are not maximizing and taking advantage of those opportunities. So that would be a big part of it, outreach and working with our community and then researching rebate programs that we might want to take on internally for our new funding sources, because we know that this is can potentially be a hardship and we wanna respond and acknowledge that. So that would be part of what this person would do. 
And then of course, we're talking this position, a key piece of it would be connecting people to resources and assistance and help and developing expertise and having knowledge about all the rebate programs that exist and advising people on how to take advantage of them. So if I could just jump in, of course. we're hearing from both Puget Sound Energy and HopeLink that our residents are underutilizing the PSE Lifeline program and the federal LIHEAP. There are, we're being told that there are residents that qualify for these programs, but they're not using them. And so how about, how do we better get the word out mm -hmm. and help our residents take advantage of what they're eligible for and not leave money on the table? Exactly. We just think that's, that's a big gap. And we see that's another example to me of why we need this position to do this kind of work on behalf of our residents. All right. So we're coming to the home stretch. Got a few more quotes for you, just for inspiration. Um, but in the city manager budget letter last fall, we talked about, we had the kind of the theme of pioneering throughout that budget letter. At the beginning of the letter, we offered one definition of a pioneer, which is one who pushes boundaries to advance a cause. And what we're talking about tonight might fit that definition. But later at the end of the budget letter, we offered another definition as well. And that is a pioneer is one who takes action to create the future not just someone who waits for or hopes for a better future, um, but someone who creates a future for themselves and others. And I like to compare it to like a, um, a hot air balloon. If you fill up a hot air balloon and send it up into the sky, where is it gonna go? It's gonna go where the wind blows it, right? But if you can put a propeller and a rudder on it, create the future for that hot air balloon and direct it where to go. And that's what we're talking about here in Kenmore is being pioneers where we can help create that better future for ourselves and for others. And so to just end on the note that we must be pioneers and take that bold action now to implement both of the council's top two priorities both climate action and affordable housing. And then we'll end with a quote from Barack Obama who said, change will not come if we wait for some other person or if we wait for some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. So based on the direction that we received from you in November, um, our recommendation is that you give us direction to take this package forward for formal adoption at the February 13th city council meeting. So what would be in front of you is the budget for this, as well as the positions and the three funding sources. Um, so the uh, garbage utility tax and the natural gas utility tax would be ordinances. And you see drafts of those ordinances as exhibits to your agenda bill. And then the increase in the vehicle license fee would be a resolution. And that draft resolution is also in your agenda bill. Councilor Baker. Is there any um, thing in this that will look specifically at low income seniors and those, uh, those non-seniors with low income. Is there anything that we're gonna be able to do for them? Because this is gonna add for somebody that's below median income or a senior that's living on $800 a month social security, they're gonna have a hard time affording this. Is there something that we can do that we're going to look at? Yes, you're talking about the $11 a month. Is that what $11 you were- $11 a month, the mm -hmm. garbage mm -hmm. utility yes. tax and the other. Yeah, I just want to just emphasize that 
we proposed this package with in mind the plan to immediately do that research, have the housing and human service. That's that's why you have on the staff of a city of our size, a housing and human services manager is to care for all of our residents, including seniors and all vulnerable populations. And I think it's really important. And I think you'll notice this is a business that cities are getting into all over our region and all around the country. These positions are more and more common if you look. So yes, I think that would be a big part of this person's job. It'd be working individually with residents who and others who would come in and have questions. They would have office hours, but also they'd be researching right away those rebate programs. And to Rob's point, making sure that people are taking advantage of the resources that already exist and making sure that they know. And we saw this with Kenmore Cares, right? We saw how hard it was for people to apply for the program. You needed sometimes a personal connection, someone to sit with you and walk through the process. And that's what I see this person doing the same type of thing, having office hours and sitting down with folks and just getting to know them and understanding what their needs are and seeing where they can find a match. So some of it might mean the city takes on the burden of that ourselves. So maybe we need to resource that and that'll be something we'll look at for these funding sources, but they're also to the point of that slide earlier, resources already available. So it'd be both. But I think this is a big part of what we see this person doing. We'd be looking for someone who has the heart for that kind of work and hiring someone. Yeah, I'm, I'm just concerned that with the large property and tax crease that was enacted and this on top of it will push a few people over the edge. And I just don't want to see that happen. Yeah, I don't, and none of us do. I appreciate that's a great question. Thank you. Council member file. Thank you. I have a kind of a list of questions. And so first, I, I'm going to ask our mayor for some clarification. Would you like to address certain topics one by one or just hit them all? As long as it has to do with the climate action plan Very and good. the housing and human services okay. plan in front of us. Thank you. Okay, so I want to start on the energy piece. Um, I see the the plan with Puget Sound Green Energy uh, and the connection there to be future forward, innovative thinkers, and we are. Um, we have to really consider multi-layered approach uh, to the solution. So we can't, uh, putting our eggs all in one basket would be uh, an injustice to our community. Um, where I'm thinking and where I'm going with this is that the innovation is with microgrid technology, solar technology, um, um, also storing and banking some of that um, energy produced for those emergency um, preparedness issues. Uh, the leading uh, development happening all across our state uh, with great excitement is is you know this microgrid technology of hybrid um, conversion and uh, e power. We are also off of a high high rate um, public energy line in Kenmore. We are fortunate in this, which means that there's a layer of deeper affordability that could be had um, should we tap into that. Um, and it's something we need to think about. The future of aviation is hybrid technology, uh, e-technology. They're already utilizing um, Councilmember, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I'm I just, apologize if it wasn't clear. What we're discussing here is the funding plan for the climate okay. action plan, not the internal workings of the climate action okay. plan. I do want to see us looking at multi-layered approach. I think I'm very concerned about sticking to just a PSE approach because that's like a monopoly <laughs> if we only have one opportunity in our, in our city limits. Um, and the other thing is on housing and human services. Um, the multi-layer approach is beautiful. I think it's really important. Um, I, I want to fully fund both. And I, I, I believe that uh, we have a pathway for increasing um, staffing with apprenticeship and internship. So I hope that we stand behind our legislative agenda 
um, which is workforce, uh, you know, uh, worker retraining, um, job training as opportunities and to help uh, fund or opening up our funding. Um, and lastly, on the, the car tabs piece or the, the licensing fee issue, um, I understand it's important to, to raise this, this tax. It is gonna hit some people hard. Um, veterans have a way of accessing a free or reduced uh, licensure, uh, which is great. Um, but I don't know if municipalities can connect a program to, or support a program to connect a, a lower income waiver or a reduction for those who are on uh, fixed incomes, uh, whether they're disabled, seniors or veterans, or um, families on TANF, you know, WIC, a SNAP. Um, I just want us to be mindful. And I know we all care about our community, we're compassionate, and we want to see our community thrive. Um, in greater end, I, I want to see us fully funding this at 2% of our budget. I'm willing to um, have a voter um, informed uh, vote come to us. Um, I think our community would stand with us on this one. Uh, as long as we, we have, uh, we can fund both of these well and execute them well, we can support our community in mindful ways. So thank you. Councilmember Marshall. I want to reemphasize what our city manager so eloquently pointed out with the multifaceted nature of our goal number one, which is implement the adopted climate action plan, climate action plan, and promote environmental stewardship. And then we got the enumerated sections, water, air, forest, habitat restoration, and preservation, and mention of those all the creatures that go along with that in our ecology. I mean, I think that's extremely important and it's that's, I think, gotta be what we view our actions through or an important lens of it, so, you know, along with the balancing, I think, looking for a real balance with affordable housing, the second goal. But just two quick questions. And um, it is, are there right now programs we're aware of for uh, rebate or reduction or hardship for that solid waste? Are there programs in place right now with the utility, do we know, uh, and also the car tabs? I, I did not check to see if there were any of those right now. Yeah, we put that question to both um, the state on the car tabs and to Republic Services on um, the garbage utility tax, and we haven't heard back from them yet on that. So that's thank you for uh, putting that question. You know, that's I mean, this is exactly the sort of thoroughness and work that I'm impressed by this plan, uh, impressed by the plan that you bring to us. Thank you. Council member file. Just to a point to um, our council members question, Republic Services doesn't have a low income program. However, our connection with um, the solid waste um, site is there is a, a, a waiver and also a low income threshold for like a $15 dump. Um, so that's an opportunity. Also the hazardous waste committee has up to $15,000 waiver for individual businesses, neighborhoods, HOAs to, to make such a, a, a dump as well. Thank you. Council Member Shrebnik. I have one quick question and then a comment or two. Um, my quick question is, um, when would these um, taxes go into effect? In other words, when would actually people see these on their bills, for example? Well, thank you for that. And I probably should have had that in the presentation. Yeah, so um, both Republic and Puget Sound Energy need a couple of months notice. Right. So if you adopt it in mid-February, we're thinking it will go into effect May 1st. Now, state law, and, and Don Rayton, our city attorney, pointed that out to me. State law says that you got to give six months notice on the car tab fee. So that would be um, September 1st. And in our revenue estimates, we ha had that coming in a little sooner. So our revenues are off by a bit. But um, the 
the full year projections are fine. It's just the partial year fund of, for 2023 that's off by about 50 to 75,000. Great. Well, I mean, not great on being off, but <laughs> great on when they go into effect. Because I think what that means is that we would have, you know, presumably the human service manager and we will have some answers on the, yeah. on the rebates and um, be able to make a determination whether um, the city needs to take a more act active role in providing those rebates if we can't find other sources. So that was my question. And then um, the comment, which I, I, um, I know, Rob, I've emailed you the list, but I wanted to say it publicly as well. I really appreciate um, how you've done some thinking about what are the uh, kind of early actions that can be taken with um, few resources and large impact. Um, and um, in addition, of course, to, to having a manager who will look for additional funding for the actions that have high impact and do cost more money. Um, so I wanna add a few more to the um, high impact and not a lot of money category that are from our action plan. So for example, implementing a commute trip reduction program in-house and promoting that to other organizations and businesses in our community, developing a green purchasing policy internally and again promoting that externally in our community to businesses and organizations changing over to electric vehicles as our vehicles which i think is already our plan as our vehicles reach the end of their usable life so that's fleet using energy efficient practices in our buildings city buildings and promoting that within our community to businesses and organizations. Going beyond the state building code. So for example, these are policy changes requiring new buildings to be solar ready and EV ready, having waste bins, rain gardens, sufficient appliances and plumbing. Having uh, implementing residential energy disclosure at point of sale, Seattle has that. Again, these are policy changes. These don't cost uh, money, except potentially to uh, developers on some of these. Um, those are the big ones. Oh, and streamlining permitting for things like um, green roofs, solar. Um, several cities have um, streamlined permitting for those. So I just want to add those to the list. I'm fully in support of this plan. I think it um, balances uh, the urgency with um, fiscal responsibility. And frankly, if we put it to the voters, we couldn't get money faster than we could get grants. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from our new hire when that happens to what are the most efficient and effective ways to get more money to complete this project. Yeah, the chair would also remind folks that we are discussing the funding plan, not the individual climate or human services plan. So if we keep our discussion to that, I'd appreciate it. Councilmember Marshall. I apologize, should have asked earlier and maybe council member Shrebnik already touched on it, but the human services manager could then look into Kenmore itself, perhaps providing hardship exemptions or rebates or reductions for solid the solid waste in the car tab. That is correct. Okay, thank you. We're going to look into whether that's feasible and yeah. And, and make a recommendation based on that research. Yeah. Councilman Kugler. Thank you so much for that presentation. It was very um, inspiring. I loved all the quotes. And um, I have uh, a number of different comments that are not in any particular order that I just bullet pointed. Um, first, I wanna thank all of our residents who spoke tonight and or who wrote in with comments on what we're discussing tonight. Um, I feel like we've had some very you know, passionate, committed um, residents um, coming to several, our several of our meetings for weeks now um, and even going so far as doing like local outreach. So that is much appreciated. Um, I am very sensitive to what we're spending, knowing how stretched some families are right now, knowing that we're experiencing, you know, highest levels of inflation. Um, and 
also recognizing that what we're proposing takes us from some, in some cases, like lower amounts or non-existent tax rates to then some of the highest for those categories. Um, I think with the impact spread out over the length of a year, the example shows that it's probably manageable for most, but it will be critical for us to help residents for whom utility rebates are available and or needed. Um, and I'm glad to hear that support service funds are available and, um, and knowing that we can connect our residents with some of those available services um, because they might lack the time or knowledge to apply. Um, I, I hate our regressive tax system. It's something that, I, that we all um, have asked to advocate for as part of our legislative agenda. There's not much that we can do there, I think, but we all recognize that it is a problem. Um, and I feel we need to fund this plan and um, we have to take bold steps to do our part at the local level. Um, I think so many residents worded this really well, like managing and mitigating risks for both near and long and long term climate change impacts for our residents and especially our youth. Um, and Sorry, I have so many comments, was that okay? Um, I, I also agree that climate change has a disparate impact on low income and disadvantaged populations um, and love the idea of some sort of citizen involvement or work group. I think it could be especially effective when it comes to like outreach for educational purposes and um, enlisting residents to do their part to reduce environmental impact. Um, and when it comes to the housing and human services, like our nonprofits and their staff are experiencing a lot of burnout and turnover. It is not well-funded. They are not well-paid. We all know this. Um, I, I think this is something that government really needs to and should be looking at and, and funding properly. I think the fact that we, um, I think, all of the comments about how hiring a housing and human services manager would improve efficiencies makes a lot of sense to me. And I think hiring the CAP director is the first step to you know, identify needs, um, including who needs to be on their team and finding sources for funding. So thank you for what you propose. I'm in full support. Deputy Mayor. First, I wanna thank our community for um, their participation and commitment to our um, environment, to the Climate Action Plan, making their voices heard, validating what we know that this is a top priority and that we need to take action. Um, I'm going to, I, might, I may speak more to that towards the end because I, I really do believe community involvement is incredibly important here. And we have to get creative about what that looks like. Actually, I'll just go here. And I don't know what it looks like. I think it's wonderful that our community is interested in finding ways to support our city. One thing that I've learned in the three years that I've been on the council is how deep and broad the work the city is already doing towards climate action. So I'm comforted by our commitment, but we have people in our community that want to be engaged. And what does that look like? I don't know, but I personally wanna see our community doing more Swamp Creek restoration projects, having the empowerment and knowledge that they're going to be able to come to our city to get their hands dirty and make a difference, to actually take action. Because guess what? We have a lot of committees. We've got a lot of task force. We've got a lot of these things. But climate action is how are we going to get boots on the ground now and motivate our community to do this work with us and inspire other communities to do the same? Because I haven't seen anything like what I'm just thinking about here. And this is inspired by our community. How do we do this? How do we empower our students, our families, our seniors, everyone to go, what can we do here? And every, all hands on deck, what does it look like? I'm not sure. I think there's a way that we as a city can 
create something incredibly special, bigger, better than a task force or committee, something that is about action. Um, uh, when I ran, I did want a committee or a task force, so I understand where that's coming from, but I want something bigger that is really truly engaging for our community, not six people, not 15 people. I want more. Um, this is one of my favorite presentations that I've been to here. I'm really thankful for the visionary language, the heartfelt language, language that I don't think a lot of councils would use. Hope or city staff, hope, empowerment, action, and love, like actually putting that word love. This is really what being is about. Love is about connection and connection is more than just to each other as people connection to being on this planet and a part of the system that it is. So thank you for bringing that in. It's, it's I, I'm going to guess not many. I mean, I, I just, I, I was very moved when I saw that. The other piece is the pairing um, of the twin crisis of climate action, housing and human services, another bold move. And I, I'm thankful to see that our entire council understands that and supports it. Um, so that's great. As far as funding, we are fully funding where we are right now. I am impressed with where we are. I want more. I wanted, I wanted the moon when we first started talking about this. We are getting started, and I have faith that we, if if our if our cap manager needs staffing immediately, I know that this council is going to figure out a way to support it because we have to. It is urgent. But right now we need someone who's able to rally the troops and help make a plan to say, these are exactly the staff that we need. I love the ideas that were proposed by our community members. We need a cap manager who can present this to us and get this done the way that they can help lead our city. So I know that we can get there. Um, so funding, we aren't funding it yet. We're getting there, we're doing it now. We are doing something more than we're already doing. And I know that our staff is going to work with this cap manager to bring them up to speed on what we're already doing and see how we can get bigger and better at it. So I think it's, I think we're on track. I think we're on track. I fully support this um, proposal where we're at. Um, I have one more thing, let me, oh, a huge thank you, thank you to council member Marshall for drawing out that we have forest and environmental stewardship included in the cap. Because from my perspective, that is the number one thing that this city can be working on. And it's the thing that we can engage our community in. And it is for our future. And it's a lens that every community needs to be looking at. So I'm very thankful that we have it in our priority for climate action. And I wanna thank Council Member Marshall for drawing it out because this is one of my expectations as we implement. Um, at least I want to speak to that. It's not like we are a council working together for the community, but when I think about climate action, it's a high, high priority to me that we look at what we can to restore and preserve our environment, creating resiliency for our future and improving things. So, um, I'm going to let it go. I just want to say thank you. Thank you to our community and thank you to you for the depth of care that you put forward in this presentation and the words of action and love, because that's what we need today. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't, my colleagues have already said everything um, that I was going to say. I. Uh, it's the downside of being mayor is you usually go last with these things, um, or at least last on the first go around. Um, I want to thank staff for bringing together this plan. I think it's a, I think it's a solid plan. I think as the deputy mayor said, it's a solid first step. Um, and I think we do need to give the um, climate action plan manager a chance to start in the position and figure out what they need to uh, to succeed um, and figure out what the community outreach looks like um, for them to be successful also. So I'm looking forward to that hire as well as the, um, as well as the human services manager um, to start, you know, laying the groundwork for, for what our work is gonna look like. Um, 
So I'm excited about this plan. I appreciate uh, all of our uh, residents coming out and speaking today and over the last few months. Um, it's, about, it's really valuable to hear from everybody and we really appreciate that. Um, and I'm looking forward to approving this package. Uh, Councilman Marshall. Thanks. I wanted to thank the deputy mayor for um, her crediting uh, to me, but I have to say that that inspiration for my looking at all of our goals that we put together really came from our words in the city or the words from the city manager tonight and his studious attention to those goals. I mean, that's that's where it came from. And I'm uh, grateful that we've got that as ever, that close attention to what we're looking for. So it came from him. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Our city manager had a response. Oh, sorry. Yes, of course, Rob. One thing I meant to say earlier, and I apologize, and I'm ruining the rhythm here, but um, one thing we intend to do, given the urgency that you've all communicated, is mm -hmm. that we actually, if you give us direction to come back to you on the 13th, we actually plan on recruiting for the Climate Action Plan Manager this week, subject to funding on the 13th, of course, but uh, we're ready to move and advertise the position this week. So I just wanted to add that as well. Deputy Mayor. City Manager, you stole my thunder. I was going to say, how soon can we have this position filled? Because I knew we were queued up. So thank you for sharing that with our community. Any further comments? I believe that there's a general consensus at the dais to come forward with this. Do you need formal direction or? And the, the proposed motion is there on the agenda bill if, if you wanted to do a motion with a section. Sure, the chair will entertain a motion to direct the city manager to bring forward the funding ordinances and proposed budget plan for the climate action plan implementation and housing and human services. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please take the roll. Can I ask real quick to clarify who seconded? Uh, Councilmember Shrebnik. Thank you. On the motion to direct the city manager to bring forward the funding ordinances and proposed budget plan for the climate action plan implementation and housing and human services for city council consideration and action on February 13th, 2023, seconded by Councilmember Shrebnik. Deputy Mayor O'Kane? Yes. Councilmember Shrebnik? Yes. Councilmember File? Yes. Councilmember Baker? Yes. Councilmember Kugler? Yes. Councilmember Marshall? Yes. Mayor Herbig? Yes. With seven yeses and zero noes, the motion passes. Thank you very much. Next on the agenda, proposal for the Kenmore Farmers Market SNAP Benefit Program. Oh, it is nine o'clock. Thank you very much, Councilmember Shrebnik. We are going to take a quick, I would say about seven minute break. We'll come back around 9.15.
City Council will return from our brief break. Uh, next on the agenda, proposal um, proposal of the Kenmore's Farmers Market SNAP Benefit Program in 2023 and 2024, presented by volunteer and event supervisor Stephanie Brown, event specialist Nicole Suarez, and Washington State Farmers Market Association King and Pierce County Regional Lead uh, Leah Newman Bell. Greetings, Mayor Herbig and Council members. Thank you for your time to tonight to learn more about the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program at the Kenmore Farmers Market. We are looking for council direction tonight on, on adding the SNAP program to the Kenmore Farmers Market. After a presentation and discussion, we'll be asking you to select one of the three options listed at the end of the memo that you have received. For a bit of background and review, at the October 3rd, 2022 Kenmore Farmers Market meeting, or sorry, City Kenmore City Council meeting, Stephanie Brown and I gave a recap presentation of the Kenmore Farmers Market pilot program. The presentation included key highlights and successes of the pilot program. The presentation also included possible elements of growth changes and additions to the market if it were to be funded for future years. One of the possible elements discussed was offering food access programs at the Kenmore Farmers Market. Food access programs include Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, which we're here to discuss tonight, WIC, Women, Infant, and Children, and the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program, and SNAP Market Match. Overall, these programs help everyone have access to fresh, healthy, local food and foster healthy communities and individuals by enabling low income shoppers to purchase more fresh produce from local farmers. As discussed and presented at the October 3rd council meeting, the Kenmore Farmers Market Program will offer the women, infant and children and senior farmers market nutrition program for the 2023 and 2024 farmers market seasons as the recipients of these programs can purchase uh, qualified foods directly from the vendors with their benefit cards. In terms of offering the SNAP program, there is a bit more to consider. So in order for the Kenmore Farmers Market to offer this program, the following pieces have to be in place, which you all received in, our, in the memo. Um, so I just wanted to highlight some of the bigger overarching pieces to, that need to be in place. So there, we need to apply to become a SNAP market match, per, uh, or excuse me, a SNAP market. Um, we need to um, procure a machine, which would swipe the EBT cards. And we need to educate qualified vendors um, on, to receive the tokens. We need to hire a um, bookkeeper who would reconcile um, all the funds incoming funds and outgoing funds. And we need to partner with our finance department to develop an accounting um, and protocol system for this. And importantly, we need to advertise within the community so our residents, residents know about this, um, the, the benefits in this program offerings. So in order to complete the above mentioned tasks, additional staff would need to be required. Um, that we would need to hire a, a bookkeeper, cashier, um, staff member to run and operate this program at the farmer's market. And we'd need to tap into um, our current, uh, one of our current accountants time to help oversee this program as well. The markets that accept the SNAP program typically do have additional trained staff, um, trained volunteer or trained board members to run and facilitate this program. Uh, this individual will need to be adequately trained to deal with problems that may come up with a machine not working or any other incidentals pertaining to the program. Um, now I'd like to welcome Lee Newman Bell, who is the King and Pierce County Regional Lead for Food Access Programs at Farmers Markets in Washington. Lee will provide an overview of the SNAP mark of the SNAP program, as well as walk us through the logistics of how this program works at the markets. Hi, Lee. Great. Thank you so much, Nicole, and the city council members for having me here to talk about how SNAP works at the farmer's market level. Um, as Nicole mentioned, I work in King and Pierce counties, assisting farmer's markets um, managers and staff to run 
to implement and run successful food access programs. I'm part of a team that works all over the state of Washington in different geographic areas to support this kind of work. And over the years, we've developed really strong relationships with farmers markets, regional food assistance groups, state and federal partners, just to ensure that farmers markets are feeling supportive and can run food access programs successfully. Um, we do host monthly forums that are available to any uh, farmers market, and these focus on current programming, creative ideas and topics in the food access realm, as well as being available for one on one assistance with market staff. So there are resources to do this um, programming. Um, before I go through the nuts and bolts of how the SNAP program works at the farmer's market, I just wanted to share a couple data points um, to put this in context within King County. Um, and unfortunately, these data points are from 2021 because we don't have the 2022 data quite cleaned yet, um, but I do think they're illustrative of the program's breadth. Um, so in 2021, from 30 reporting farmers markets, there were over or nearly $600,000 in SNAP benefits redeemed through farmers markets. Um, that accounts for over 18,000 individual SNAP transactions. And each of those transactions, or I would say the average transaction is roughly $32. Um, so this just gives an idea of the breadth of the program and the economic impact that it has in the farmer's market world and in the community. Um, needless to say, this program is complicated and it does require careful planning. Um, so as Nicole mentioned, uh, a farmer's market has to become authorized to be a SNAP retailer. And that just means that they can swipe EBT cards and participate in the program. Um, once the market is authorized, there are a few pieces of equipment and materials that they will need to run the program. One that she mentioned is a point of sale machine to swipe the EBT cards at the market. Um, the next thing that markets need are some form of currency, so usually tokens or sometimes um, individually designed fake paper currency, but most markets use tokens, and these act as um, script or effectively uh, the currency that EBT cardholders can use to spend at the market. Um, next, markets often need a safe storage area for these tokens and the POS machine, so a lockbox or a safe. It is required to hang signage indicating that EBT is accepted at the market. Um, this signage is provided for free through um, DSHS, uh, but often markets provide more signage or opt to use more signage just to make it really clear to customers and easy to locate where they go to swipe their EBT card. Um, and then before the market starts, you'd also want to distribute these zipper pouches with sales sheets where the authorized or sorry, where the vendors that are SNAP selling SNAP eligible items can put the tokens and record the total tokens they receive for a day. Um, basically, a SNAP customer can use their EBT card in a similar way at the info booth to how you would swipe a debit or credit card. They would approach the information booth, ask the market staff person to swipe their EBT card for the desired amount that they want. So if they wanted $10, that market staff would swipe for $10, then they would input their PIN and the staff person would give them $10 worth of tokens to spend at the market. And they spend those directly with the vendors who are selling SNAP eligible items. I just wanted to make a note that SNAP eligible items are the same at farmer's markets um, as they are in a grocery store. So these are fresh produce, fruits, vegetables, also seeds and plant starts, um, bread, dairy products, meat, uh, all of the items that you see here. And it's also inclusive of like frozen foods. So frozen tamales or pasta, or anything that's not hot and ready to eat at the market. So what cannot be purchased with SNAP, or with SNAP is um, 
like a hot dog or something that's ready to eat at the market. Obviously, tobacco and alcohol products uh, cannot be purchased with SNAP benefits and nor can like any kind of hygiene um, or household product. So it does require a bit of education at times just to make sure all the vendors that are selling these products know um, that they're also a part of this program and they know how to direct customers when they ask questions. So then you've made it through a successful market day at the end of the market. Um, that market staff person would want to go around and collect the filled out sales sheets from each of the vendors that have accepted SNAP tokens um, and confirm that the number that that uh, producer or vendor has written down matches the number of tokens in the zipper sheet. And then they would record that information um, to send along to the accounting department in order to cut those vendors' checks or pay them however um, the city decides to navigate that portion of the program. Um, then the market staff person also needs to count the total number of tokens. They have the number they started with at the beginning of the market day, and they want to see what if there is a difference between that number and the number they end up with the at the end of the day. And that is important because they'll know how many tokens are in circulation still that customers may have not spent at that market day, um, and they can account for that number. It's just an important piece of making sure that they have that if they were to be audited. Um, and then the market staff, um, yeah, would share this information with the accounting department as well to make sure that it's well recorded. Um, so those are like, it's a really kind of fast and dirty um, version of how the program works. Uh, this program can be really a great asset to the community um, if run successfully and planned well and staffed um, appropriately, because it really does improve the access um, for more people to buy, as Nicole mentioned, local um, food at the farmer's market. So I think we have time for questions now. Questions? Council member file. Thank you. I am so delighted this is before us. This is such an important service to our community to help bridge uh, opportunity gaps and uh, improve nutrition um, here in our own uh, local community. So I have a question about this token wooden nickel thing. Um, I'm just gonna be as casual like that. <laughs> um, I have concern about uh, a seeable difference for the shopper. And uh, DSA just worked really hard to um, reduce disparities and uh, stigma and shame attached to using, you know, what used to be wood chess and uh, what used to be um, vouchers. Yeah, that's now an EBT card, right? Um, is there any reason why we couldn't utilize a card like system uh, that could be swiped uh, or does it have to be this token um, option? Um, I really rather something that looks the same as others have opportunity to use at the market. Yeah, thanks for that question, Council Member File. Lee, do you do you want to speak yeah. to that? Thanks. Yeah, so I think that is something that DSHS and the Department of Health are thinking about, as you mentioned, and it is a really important question. Um, the the difference would be you could have vendors. Um, or you could have customers swipe at vendors booth, but each of those vendors would have to be authorized through the food and nutrition service to be able to accept SNAP benefits um, on their own accord. So there's kind of two systems. There's either the market accepts 
these benefits on behalf of the vendors, and then there's this token system where the vendors have to be authorized. And to be quite frank, it's quite a bit of work to become authorized. So there are some vendors that are, they're typically larger farms with more resources, but it does exclude um, at the moment quite a few vendors from participating in the program. So there are um, advantages and disadvantages to going that route, but it is possible. Thank you. Councilmember Shrevenick. Yeah, a couple questions. Um, it looked like maybe there was hope in the future um, for having a system uh, where vendors can can take more direct payment like that. Um, how far out do we think that's going to be? I mean, is it like a year or is it 10 years? Or <laughs> I have the sense that it will be in the next two to three years. Okay. And it's going to be a slow rollout because of this vendor education piece and capability of taking on that process, yeah. but right. sooner than the next 10 years. Okay. All right. And then my other question was, um, it looked like this memo, I think, Nicole, you, you specifically said it didn't address the market match. Um, is there a way to get just a brief explanation of that? I mean, is it similar in terms of... Um, challenges logistically, that kind of thing. Yeah, the yeah. match, go yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the, you can elaborate too, but the match is a, is a separate program that um, basically matches those, those um, benefit dollars. And that's another, another program to bring in down the line as well. Um, and then I bet that I believe that the reimbursement rate is a little delayed so it would be okay. another step with our accounting. so so you first you have to do the first snap process basically to have a foundation to do the match on top of yeah Thank that's what, that's that's super helpful Thank yeah, you and that's the, what we've laid out for here in the plan mm -hmm. and Lee do you want to elaborate on any more of the match program I mean I think that's exactly right um, it it does function very similar to the Base SNAP program, but yes, you have to run the SNAP program um, before signing up for the match program. But I think that's a great option down the line for Kenmore. Questions? I've got, oh, Councilmember Kuban. Um, <clears throat> um, thank you so much for coming tonight, first off. And um, I appreciated hearing the like the um, um, advice that if we move forward with the program, that it could be a great asset if planned and run well and staffed appropriately. And I think you were like very deliberate in pointing out like the important things that we need. I'm curious, like what are some of the potential, I guess, problems or things that we should be aware of that are risks if we were not to adequately do one of those things? If I can answer, um, I think the biggest risk is offering the program for one year and then not continuing to offer the program because you've invested so many resources and so much effort in marketing the program, letting people know that it's there. And then when those programs go away, it just causes further confusion and um it's hard on the SNAP users to, you know, follow a moving target. So consistency is really vital for these programs and the participants of them. Um, but in sort of like the daily operations of the market, I think having staff that are dedicated to, or at least really well educated in communicating the program is huge in terms of getting high participation in the program, making sure that uh, SNAP users feel comfortable at the market, they feel welcome there. You can reduce some of that stigma and um, by having staff as well as vendors that can answer questions really easily, as well as having like really clear signage and really clear information about how the program works. So 
that's some of the like legwork that um, makes the program more accessible to people and makes them feel good about using it at a farmer's market. On the technical end, um, there are there has been like some issues in the past with point of sale machines. And a lot of that is something that uh, the team that I'm on can troubleshoot with our state partners and support the markets in addressing. Um, hopefully we worked really hard to get some of those kinks out in the last couple of years, but they do come up. So um, yeah, just tech glitches and things like that. Nicole, did you have anything else to add? No, that, that covers it. Thank you. Um, I am very interested in us getting to the point where we can use the match program because I think that's a really wonderful uh, way of um, getting folks, you know, additional use out of their out of um, out of the program. And um, so I would love to see us move forward with um, with this this year. I, I do have a question though. From your experience, uh, Lee, is do farmers markets who go through the work of putting these systems in place, does that become something that is an incentive or makes a farmer's market more attractive to vendors? It does provide additional sales to vendors. So I think it's not like a giant amount, um, but it's definitely, I think, an impactful amount to vendors who are selling produce um, and other SNAP eligible items at the market. So I definitely think um, it's attractive to vendors. And there are a lot of vendors that um, sell at multiple markets. So there is knowledge of the program and support for it um, from the vendor level too, just from a standpoint that they also want to sell to and have um, their product be accessible to as many audiences as possible, as many customers as possible. Yeah, good question. And I was looking in this and maybe I missed it in the memo. And if I did, I apologize. But mention that we're gonna be able to take WIC. What makes WIC different than, than, um, than SNAP as far as like how the, um, oh, sorry, but yeah. What makes it different than SNAP as far as, our ability to take that, to accept that. Yeah, so kind of two different programs with the WIC and Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program being a state program versus okay. a federal program. That answers and then, everything. And then just to elaborate a little more, it's um, direct to vendor payment too. So it, it there's no middleman city in this instance required in the in the transaction. Okay, super. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Any other questions? Customer Baker. No, I will. Councilmember Baker, your microphone. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Councilmember File. Would uh, hiring that a human housing and human services provider um, earlier rather than later help with a separate? Um, Mr. City Manager. I don't think so, because we're going to be, um, we would just hire that um, part-time person and they'd be able to get going regardless of whether we have the Housing Human Services Manager. I'm seeing head nods. Yeah, yeah I think it, it can be a separate it, they can potentially, you know, partner together or collaborate, but it's a separate and one would hope that this bookkeeper cashier is familiar with the farmer's market world and familiar with the SNAP program as well. So very good. Thank be, you. That's a good, good question, though. Thank you. Yeah. And in addition, this new hire would be part of the events team and reporting to Nicole. Very good. Thank you. Councilor Baker. Yeah, I'd like to move that we include the SNAP benefit program as part of the market. Seconded. Motion a second. Any discussion? Not seeing any. Would the clerk please take the roll? On the motion to add the SNAP benefit to the farmer's market, seconded by Councilmember File. Councilmember Baker? Yes. Councilmember File? Wholeheartedly, yes. Councilmember Marshall? Yes. Councilmember Kugler? 
Yes. Council Member Shrebnik? Yes. Deputy Mayor Kane? Yes. Mayor Herbig? Yes. With seven yeses and zero noes, the motion passes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councilor Marshall? Did we have to choose, or did we choose one of the options for you, or? As I think we effectively we did chose. And the, okay, I think it's great. One. Yeah. Okay. Or three. Three. Thank you. Uh, staff report. Just a few items. Um, on a personal slash professional note, um, the former Gig Harbor mayor, Chuck Hunter, passed away on January 15th. He's the mayor that I worked for uh, when I was there. Um, so I'll be attending his memorial service this Wednesday. I'll take some vacation time to do it. It's in the middle of the day down in Gig Harbor. Um, I'm really excited about the For the Love of Kenmore event that's coming up on February 9th. I've got some great guest speakers lined up and some just real inspirational examples of co-creators that will just really inspire people. We need your help in, in getting people there. So if you could like actually personally invite people to come. That would, that's what I found really drives attendance is personal invitations to this event. Um, so if you could help us with that. Um, and then I'd like Michelle, speaking of co-creators and where's the fun, I'd like Brian to put up something on the screen here. So this is the Wallace Swamp Creek Habitat Restoration Group. And below are some photos from the work they did last Monday. Can you scroll down? Yeah, right there. So these are actually photos for taken a week ago on uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. So isn't that great? So that just warms my heart. So it was a great day. And if that's not enough, I've got more. Um, there was another group of volunteers also busy that very same day picking up litter on 175th. And there they are. And there's a couple Kenmore city employees. There you see Maura Query right there in the front and Stephanie Bond, our receptionist there. So they picked up, I think, close to 100 pounds of garbage that day, right on 75th. Yeah, look at those bags. So. That's all I have, Your Honor. All right, Council Member reports and comments. Council Member Baker. Yes. Um, Council Member Baker, your microphone. I'm glad that you mentioned co-creators because the Kenmore uh, rowing, uh, the Kenmore uh, dragon boat group and the canoe and kayak broke uh, group in conjunction with the uh, 25th anniversary of the city want to run a milk carton race from Bothell to Kenmore, where they will build boats out of milk cartons Boy. and um, plastic bottles, I'm hoping, and uh, paddle down from uh, Bothell to Kenmore. So as part of the 25th uh, anniversary festivities, uh, we hope we have your blessing to do that. So they would like sit on a bunch of milk cartons all bound together. Yep. Have you? We're, we're, I, I don't know if they still do it at Green Lake, but it used to be an annual event at Green Lake, and it was always a hoot to watch. And something I always wanted to do as a kid, never quite got around to. And don't we have perfectly good boats that work? That we could, <laughs> that's yeah, part of the fun. Know, the thing with the milk <laughs> cartons is people enter this over the years and they get a lot of milk cartons and they make actually boat shaped um, things out of, uh, out of milk cartons. So I'm sure the first year or so, I don't know. We've never done this before, so we don't know, but we imagine they start as rafts and grow from there. But right. um, the nice thing about it is there are no organizations. So we form our own organization and we make up our own rules. So. <laughs> It works quite well. Sounds awesome. Councilmember Marshall. I'm reading a book right now in which the author claims that it's the first biography of Chief Self. And as part of that, either directly in the book or maybe as real quick secondary research from like Wikipedia, I saw referenced 
uh, was some some years ago that indeed the area around the mouth of the Sammamish Slough in Kenmore here, when it was further east before the lake was lowered, was was called Ahwadis. So I thought that was really cool that there's bibliographic uh, support, uh, of course, for that place name. Um, I have a motion and I promise to keep it uh, very brief. And uh, I'll just give the motion first. And then if I get a second, see if I get a chance to speak to it. And the motion would be um, if uh, to put on our agenda, no later than February 27th, whether Kenmore takes a position and what position on Washington State Legislature pending middle housing legislation. So that's the motion. Well, let's see if I can get a second. Clarification. Didn't we already take a position with our legislative agenda to? Uh... Where where we we need a second if we're going to have a discussion around this. That's right. I'm not hearing a second. So. Okay. Councilor Cooper. Um, just want to wish everyone a happy Lunar New Year, and um, really excited about the cap work that we're embarking on and the. Uh, Housing and Human Services that we made a decision on tonight. That's it. Councilmember Shrebnik. Uh, I just want to express my appreciation for the canoe kayak and uh, dragon boat program for taking on the milk carton boat race idea. I love it. <laughs> Councilmember File. Thank you. Um, I also want to echo. Um, the celebration for uh, Lunar New Year. This is an exciting um, time for community and uh, wanna wish people, our community, um, peace, joy, um, much luck and happiness. Um, other than that, I attended the Nusha Awards event last week and uh, Kemore was recognized a couple times over for their excellent work and service, along with our city manager um, for the DEIA and uh, Stephanie Lukash, our deputy uh, manager, um, accepted an award on behalf of Kenmore as well for our, our work. I couldn't be more proud. Um, it's great to be among so many outstanding, amazing regional leaders doing leading work um, and to be identified as leaders amongst them. So it's, it's something to be uh, just really applaud, applaud all the work we've done together and, and thank you uh, for supporting the work. Um, other than that, um, I've been invited back to, to serve on the National League of Cities uh, Federal Committee for Human Development and um, the Sound Cities uh, Hazardous Waste Committee. So I've accepted and I'm, I'm happy to continue that work. Deputy Mayor. I'm thankful for a very productive meeting this evening and the great work of our staff uh, coming forward with the um, Climate Action Plan, Health and Human Services proposal in particular. Um, I'm excited about the SNAP benefits for the farmer's market. And um, I think that's it. Just really a lot of gratitude for the work that this city is doing right now. Thank you. Not a lot to report, although I will say since our last uh, formal meeting, um, I was elected chair of the Eastside Transportation Partnership. Um, I was vice chair last year working with um, Councilmember Zahn out of Bellevue as the chair, and um, I am the chair, and now uh, Councilmember um, De Michelle out of Issaquah is my vice chair. So that'll be fun. It'll be a good year. I'm meeting with her on Friday. So anyway, unless there's anything more to come before us, this is Kimmer City Council stands adjourned. Mm -hmm.